appreciate you guys taking the time to come to our session um, around progressive discipline. Uh, JP Frame, uh, who was a counselor at KM and now has transitioned to behavior intervention specialist. And Mike Simmons, who's been our dean of students at KM for the last 10 years. Um, this is really kind of uh, JP's baby, and Mike works with him on the discipline side of the house uh, to make sure this is a, a very consistent and stable uh, process within our building. So I'm going to go plug this in. They can do some quick chatting with you before uh, the PowerPoint pops up. Okay, there you go. All right, well, thanks for coming. My name is Jamie Fram. I'm a behavior interventionist at Cameroonian High School. And Mike Simmons, being a student as Wayne just alluded to. Mm -hmm. um, glad that you guys are in attendance. We've got some things that's working for us at Kent Meridian High School. Um, and we think you guys will like some of the stuff that you're hearing. Uh, recently, I was at the um, Safe and Civil Schools uh, conference down in Portland and uh, had an opportunity to talk with uh, Dr. Sprick. Uh, I had a panic attack because uh, there was a section on the, the school-wide discipline seminar where they're talking about how progressive discipline is ineffective and it doesn't work and we don't recommend it. And I was like, oh my God, that's everything I've dedicated my career to for the last 10 years. But I talked to them during a break and uh, their model was more of an elementary school model, the carpool system, which I'm familiar with from having worked in a, as a teacher at a success for all school in elementary school. And their logic behind it made a lot of sense to me, but I went up to him at break and I was talking to him, I was like, can I tell you what we're doing at our school? And when I finished explaining the elevator version of what we do, he asked me for a copy of it and he's gonna be looking at it to help me further produce and manage it and see, see that if there's anything that we can improve upon. But I was really excited that uh, at the end of our discussion, he had me present to the other 200 people in the room what we were doing because he didn't have a secondary model. So this, this model is more for a secondary environment. Um, it came across my radar when I was teaching in middle school in Las Vegas, Nevada, where we worked as teams and our team used a progressive discipline model. And then when I um, transitioned up to Washington State, I was a seventh grade social studies teacher and um, we were reopening Mill Creek Middle School from Kent Junior High to Mill Creek, making that transition. And they had already established what they were gonna use school-wide didn't want to be a flying, you know, I didn't want to be a team player. And um, so I kind of kept it under wraps for a few years. And then once I was able to transition up to Kent Meridian High School, um, the way this came into being, the way we came into using this process at um, Kent Meridian <coughs> was uh, a team of teachers, staff members, had gone to, thank you, had gone to a PBIS training. And when I was getting my master's degree, I stumbled across PBIS because as a teacher, one of my frustrations would be I have this group of students, these 29, 30 students in my classroom, and there are this handful of students that they don't do anything severe enough for me to send them to the office, but they staff instructional time by the amount of times I have to intervene with their behavior during the class time. And so my question was, what do we do for the students that are there to learn and are functioning as we would expect a student to function in the classroom? And, but we can't remove these students from the learning environment to make it Setting. So how do we address that? So I, when I stumbled across PBIS and started doing my research, with its response to intervention format, which we were using for academics <coughs> at our school, I felt like it was a great fit. So when this team came back from the PBIS conference, and I had done my research, I shared with Dr. Berenger that I had this idea, this progressive discipline model that I used, I thought would dovetail very nicely with PBIS. And so the first year was voluntary, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the data, where teachers volunteered to use it, and the results were so significant that the next year we decided to make it mandatory that all teachers use it. And last year was our second year of full implementation school-wide. We don't have true fidelity yet. We're still working on fidelity. But in our third year, I'm very optimistic that we'll be approaching true fidelity in our school as we continue to support teachers that haven't fully embraced the school-wide progressive discipline model yet. And Mike's been a great support when students do arrive in the focus center of saying, what step are they on? Have you gone through and made the phone calls and done, those, done the processes and procedures? If not, we have to look at a different way of addressing it and we'll, we'll cover those things in our presentation. And I'd just like to piggyback and say it's been wonderful to have that established um, because what it has done is it has created um, more parental contact, more parental engagement and involvement, uh, more student relationship building, um, things that we try to do on a daily basis, but I think the relationship key piece of just school-wide is we start to see that impact the building. Because uh, that's the key, what we, we've always talked about, that's what Dr. Barriger 
whenever we come back from the summer, we come back to school, that's what it's talking about. Um, first and foremost, is build relationships with students, families, the community. So we're seeing a big impact on just being able to communicate with parents and getting parents to buy in. And just to trust the trust piece of it, you know, because getting parents to trust you and now they're seeing something that we're actually working with these kids through this progressive discipline model that, you know, we are looking at ways to keep them in school and keep them engaged and, 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 and hopefully it helps them at the, at the house situation too because these kids are coming in, some of them with challenges that I, I get the luxury of finding out because they come and they sit and I have the time to sit and actually chat with them and address some things, things that, you know, maybe the teachers and other people don't, don't realize that they're going through. So me pulling some of that information out of them and then tag teaming with JP if there's some some resources in the building, like we have our drug and alcohol counselors in building. We have several resources in the building that we can connect them with to hopefully we can get them back focused and back in the classroom where they need to be. And just to add to that, um, the goal is to get out in front of it before it becomes a crisis because too many times the parents are sitting in the office and their child's about to be suspended and the question they ask is, how come nobody ever called me? How come nobody ever let me know? That's built into the framework of uh, the school-wide progressive discipline model. And so um, moving forward, Dr. Berenger, if you could hand out. I have handouts of what we use in the classroom. And uh, you can you feel free to look at those and make notes on them. I have extras if you want a clean copy. But uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, what is the school-wide progressive discipline model? It is a standardized referral process. It's a framework for teachers to use for low-level behaviors that don't typically warrant a trip to the office, out of seat, off task, talking to your neighbor. But these behaviors over time have a negative impact on learning. Uh, an example I give is from my own experience as a student when I was a kid. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, I was suspended for putting rubber snakes in girls' desks. It was April 1st, and my buddies had this diabolical plan. It was before the internet, so kids were still sensitive. And uh, we we're going to put rubber snakes in girls' desks and scare them for April Fool's Day. And it worked. Some of the girls, I got the we got the reaction we were looking for, and Miss Follett had had it. So John, Annie, and I got suspended that day. And if you think about it, putting rubber snakes in a girl's desk doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but if you think about the date, April 1st, that means Miss Follett had been putting up with John, Annie, and I. September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. We never really did anything that warranted a trip to the office, but we just drove her crazy. So we got suspended for that low-level behavior. And so this, the, the idea is this doesn't replace, because what it's not is a substitute for effective classroom management. I have teachers that I talk to about this, and they say, well, I don't need it. I never send a kid to the office. And my response to them is, great, that's awesome. That means that you have within your within your classroom environment develop the relationships develop the structure that you're able to handle the discipline but if you ever come across a situation where you may need to have more than what's going on in your classroom this is the tool this is the mechanism you can use so we can justify sending a kid to the office for these low-level behaviors that over time can become very frustrating and impact the learning environment in a negative way so why well, use the school-wide progressive discipline model? As I kind of alluded to earlier in the presentation, I feel like it dovetails very nicely into the PBIS model because the PBIS model is designed to address students that are struggling in any variety of ways. But in order to do so, how do you identify who those students are? Because you have t uh, different tolerance level among teachers. So for example, when I was teaching, I'm hard of hearing, so it's difficult for me when there's a lot of background noise. So my room was always very quiet. And people would walk in, they're like, it's so quiet in here. It's like, it has to be or I can't do my job. Now, if a student had to get up and sharpen their pencil, I didn't have a problem with that. If they were getting materials, I didn't have a problem with that. But other teachers, that was a, a sticking point for them. And I'd walk into some classrooms where, for me, mentally, it was absolute chaos. But learning was taking place, typically a science class, driving me insane. So there's different tolerance levels for teachers. and so. How do you know when it's the appropriate time to send a student to the office for something that's not fighting, something that's not belligerent, like a student telling you F you? That, that'd be an automatic. But if it's just back talk or argumentative behavior, is that, does that warrant a trip to the office? So we're giving teachers a tool where they can send a student to the office and indicate that they've taken these steps, and these are appropriate steps to take, 
And at this point, it's time for me to teach my class, the students that are there, and time for these, these interventions have not proven effective. It's time for us to take it up a level. And it gives them a guide as to when that's an appropriate time. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through. We have five steps at Camp Meridian High School. Is there a way for me to click on? Well, you have that document in front of you. The blue document in front of you is the uh, progressive discipline model that we use. And so we have five steps at school. And as students move through those five steps, the consequences get progressively more severe. <coughs> and so starting with step one, well, before we get to uh, a step, I'm sorry, each step is preceded by what's called a verbal warning. And the verbal warning is key because that sends a message to the student that maybe you've talked to them several times about their behavior. Maybe a student's been out of their seat several times in class and you remind them to please sit down. I need you to sit down, please. Would you please sit down? So when you issue the verbal warning, you're telling the student, I need you to sit down, please. I've talked to you about this several times. This is your verbal warning. And that gives the student an opportunity to make a choice. Am I going to continue with the behavior and receive a consequence? Or am I going to accept that this behavior is not appropriate and correct my behavior? And the class goes on. And so, you just to add to that, every classroom has a poster of all these five steps in the classroom. Something that's gone over the first one or two days of school with all the kids so they understand that in their handbook as well as a poster in the classroom so it's not like they students would understand that okay this the teacher used the, the term this is your verbal warning versus that's different than hey I need you to stop or hey can I have you sit down or hey please follow directions when they use this term hey this is your verbal warning then they understand that okay now it's to that level that they can take me to this next part of this conversation which is more serious versus well they're just it's it's not a big deal so if the poster is pretty clear, it's in every room, it's exactly the same in every room, um, it is school-wide, so um, we make sure the kids are understanding of that, that they, they know what that means, what it sounds like, what it looks like, so they're not taken off guard. I just wanted to add that piece. It's that intentionally taught. Yeah. yeah, it's intentionally taught. So it's discussed, you know, when you receive a verbal warning, you now have a choice. Am I going to put my cell phone away as the teacher requested, or am I going to have it out again and receive the consequence? which would be step one. Now the verbal warning can come in multiple forms. Um, one is, you know, you have that creative student who comes in and they're out of their seat, they're out of their seat, you give them a verbal warning, they sit down and they're compliant. Now they have their cell phone out. You ask them to put their cell phone away and you give them a verbal warning, they're compliant. Now they're talking to their neighbor. So what's happening is you have a variety of disruptive behaviors that are, and every time you correct one, they find a new one. You can go to a general statement, which is, I want you to stop being disruptive. This is your verbal warning, and it kind of covers all the behaviors that they may come up with in their creative minds. Now, I, I say that, and in my years in education, I've heard this phrase, these kids don't know how to act. They've never been taught. And that frustrates me a little bit because I, I don't believe that. And so when I would teach my students and be intentionally teaching how the PDM process works, I'd talk about three environments, a wedding, a funeral, and a church. And I would give them examples, you know, if you were at a wedding and they were exchanging vows, would you get up and run down the aisle? No, 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 why not? That's disrespectful. If you were at church, would you stand up and say, hey, Johnny, what are you, you want to go play football after church? Absolutely not. Well, why not? Because that's disrespectful. If you're at a funeral, would you sit in the back row and giggle and tell your mama jokes? No, absolutely not, because that's disrespectful. And the students are telling me this. And some of them have never been to a funeral before. Some of them have never been to a wedding. Some of them don't go to church, but if they spend the night at grandma's, they're going to go to church that weekend, and they know how to act. And my point to them is, these are formal social settings that you've been in, and you understood how to act in those settings. School is a semi-formal setting, and it has a standard of behavior that's expected. The difference is, you don't go to a wedding every weekend. You don't go to church, if you don't go to church, but when you do go, you know how to act. You don't, hopefully you're not going to a funeral every week. But you go to school every single day from the time you're five until you're 15, 16, 17, 18, you get comfortable, you've pushed the boundaries, you know what the limits are, and then you push them a little bit more, and we get to the point where they're like, you can't make me do that. And I would tell them, you're absolutely right. I can't make you do anything. I can ask and I can request, and I can hold you accountable, but I can't make you do anything. So I'm hoping you make a good choice when I issue you a verbal warning. It can also be used in a general format with groups. So if you have group activities and there's one table that they're off task, you've talked to them a couple times, you can walk over to the group and say, ladies and gentlemen, I need you to get started on your project. This is, if I see you off task, this is good. we're gonna pull out progressive discipline model, this is your verbal warning. 
and you can walk away. And then now the expectation is that they change their behavior. If they fail to change their behavior, because you gave them the verbal warning as a group, you were within your right to pull out the school-wide progressive discipline model and initiate the appropriate steps. One student might be on step one, one student might be on step three, but it'd be appropriate to move them to their steps. You can do it at a, at, in a class format. I've had those classes where they have a really hard time coming in from the hallway and getting settled in to start the entry task. So what I would do is I would walk in, ladies and gentlemen, here's your entry task. I need you to get started on activities X, Y, and Z. I need to go take attendance for five minutes and address a couple of items over here. While I'm taking care of this business, I expect you to be on task and completing the assignment. If I see anybody off task, I'm gonna move you a step. This is your verbal warning, and it's to the entire class. So step one, the goal of step one and any step really is to, to avoid moving on to the next step. Step one's a fairly minor intervention. I've given a verbal warning to a student because they were out of their seat and off task. They, they chose to continue with that behavior. I'm not gonna throw the book at them at the appropriate time during class or maybe in between classes, I'm gonna pull them aside, I'm gonna have a one-to-one -one conversation. The conversation should not go like this. What's your problem? Can't you figure this out? Don't you know this? That's not how the conversation should go. The conversation is more of, hey, I wanna work with you on this. You know, I can't have you out of your seat in class because it disrupts the learning environment. And everybody has to have an opportunity to learn. And so, what can we do to work together? You know, do we need a nonverbal cue and, and, and troubleshoot with that student and build that relationship with that student? Let them know, you know, I'm on your side. I don't want you to move to step two because step two, I have to send a letter home. And I really don't want to do that. I'm not, I'm not here to get you in trouble. I'm telling you this because I don't want you to get in trouble. An example of that was when I taught and Dino first came out. And you can see all the kids' laptop screens on your computer. I used to stand up and announce, I'm turning on Dino. I'm watching your laptops. Please be on task. And one of the students one day told me, you're the only teacher that lets us know you're doing that. I'm like, I don't want you to get in. It's more work for me if you're getting in trouble. So why wouldn't I tell you this is what I'm doing and I'm watching? And they really appreciated the fact that I was trying to keep them out of trouble. So this conversation is more about let's work together. I know that things can be challenging sometimes. How can I support you? This is what I need you to do to support me. And let's work together on this so that you're not getting in trouble. And that's how the one-to-one -one conversation should go. And once the conversation's over, that's it. There's no phone calls home. There's no it's water under the bridge, let's move on the next day. And for a number of students, that's considered enough of an intervention for them to move forward, but some will move to step two. Step two, you'll see the yellow page that you have, that's our form letter home. And this is our first um, point of parent communication. And so at step two, after a verbal warning, a uh, student moves to step two, you continue the conversation with them about what's appropriate and inappropriate in the classroom and how you can support them and you send this letter home with the students. And you'll see it gives a, a brief description of what the purpose of the letter is, and then at the bottom of the letter, you'll see little conversation starters because we want them to talk to their parents about what's going on at school. And so there's one, one sentence in there, you know, the teacher's treating me unfair. Well, how is the teacher, why do you think the teacher's being unfair? And they, they may honestly feel that way. You know, if a student constantly has their phone out in class and I'm constantly addressing that behavior in class, they may feel like I'm picking on them when another student may have the phone out and I don't see it. So let's have that conversation. Let's open those lines of communication so we can move forward. The expectation is that this letter comes back the next day. On the back side, you'll see an address form that we use for a change of address, change of phone number, because with our transiency in our school, the high transiency rate, sometimes it's hard to reach parents because they're moving and changing cell phone numbers and, and things of that nature. So the goal is to try to keep up to date on those things as best we can. So this is a tool that um, our, uh, our uh, data processor, Jan, she asked that we put this on the back. So that's one of the things we hope that they fill out. If they don't fill it out, we're not gonna, it's not the end of the world, but hopefully we can get those, get some more of those uh, contact information from them. The expectation is this letter is returned the next day. So if I'm handing it out to a student on a Friday, the next day means Monday morning when they return to class. If I hand it out on a Monday <coughs> and they're absent Tuesday and Wednesday, the expectation is they have it ready when they walk in the door on Thursday to class. They, they take it home and they bring it back. If they don't bring it back, they automatically move to step three on the blue form. And it seems kind of harsh, but you know, kids say, well, I don't see my parents, they work nights. And I tell them, well, if it was a check for $1,000, you would get it signed. So where would you post that check? Would you tape it to the refrigerator? Would you tape it to the television? Would you put it on their pillow? You need to get that letter signed. And so the expectation is they bring it back the next day. So if they don't bring it back the next day, they move to step three. The other way you can move to step three is through the 
verbal warning through behaviors, and you move to step three. Now it starts to get a little bit more severe. What happens is um, the, parent, the, the teacher calls home and talks to the parent. Now the phone call should not be, I don't know what's wrong with your child, I don't know how they got to ninth grade, you know, this, that, and nothing. It's more like, hello, this is Mr. Frank. I'm just giving you a call to let you know that I've seen some behaviors in class that right now they're not really a big deal. They're pretty low level. It's just out of seat and things like that. But um, it makes it difficult for me to do my job. It makes it difficult for students to learn. So I'm trying to get out in front of this. You know, I don't want your student to end up in the office over time for these little things that can be easily addressed. So I'm calling you to open lines of communication and see if you can talk to your student at home about what I'm seeing in class and if you have any ideas about how I can address it or what maybe there's something going on that I'm not aware of so I can offer a little bit more support and the idea is to open up lines of communication with the parents and create a partnership because you know they'll come home and say Mr. Frame this, Mr. Frame that, Mr. Frame this and the parents hear that and they think well what and they're picking on my child but when I talk to them say well these, this is what I'm seeing in the classroom and uh, if we can work together and here's my direct line, my direct extension, if you ever have a question please feel free to give me a call. I try to have a 24 hour turnaround on parent communication because I'm a parent and when I call my child's school, I expect them to get back to me immediately. Um, email works as well. If you want to shoot me an email, I'll be sure to respond to that within 24 hours. But let's work together to see what we can do to help your child be successful at school. But please be aware that your child will have an after school detention. Now typically I'll give that after school detention the next day. Does that work for you? And for our families, a lot of our kids go home and they take care of younger siblings that are getting out of elementary school because their parents are working more than one job. Or they have a doctor's appointment. So we negotiate with the parents what day would be an appropriate day for them to serve their after school detention. We're flexible on that. There are some students who can't serve after school detention at all because they are relying on their child to take care of the younger siblings every single day. And you can't not have them go home and take care of their younger siblings. So what we do is we say, hey, you know, how about two days of lunch detention? That's the equivalent to one hour of after school. But the, here's the deal. Your child has to arrive at lunch detention on their own accord. We cannot go and get them and bring them to lunch detention. If they fail to make it, we're going to have to revert back to the after school detention and find a date that works. We're going to have to make arrangements. And typically the parents are supportive and agree to those terms. They give us a date and, and what Mike and I do, we get a list every day and because we can't rely on high school students to make it to after school detention, we go and pick them up the last 10 minutes of the day to make sure that that consequence is being served and that it actually has meaning instead of just assigning them after school detention and then skipping it 50 times. And then what the teachers do is they enter an FYI in the Skyward. They don't actually put the offense. They put an FYI in. And this is for data tracking, data tracking purposes. That FYI is then directed to behavior intervention, behavior intervention is me, and I have a spreadsheet where every, I enter every student onto that spreadsheet and I start tracking. I'm not gonna call them down. For step three, these are minor offenses and hopefully the after school detention serves as a, a deterrent for any further behavior. But if I see a student that's in step three in more than one class, that's a student I need to get in. I wanna get out in front of it. I wanna get to them before it becomes a major issue. So if a student's on step three in two or three classes, there's something going on there we need to get to the bottom of and I'm going to get them into my office and we're going to talk about what's going on, how can I support, what do we need to know. I'm going to call the parents and talk to them about what's going on in school and confirm that parent communication from the teachers is taking place. Again, after a verbal warning, a student can move to step four. Now we're getting into the, the red zone. And so at step four, a student will receive two after school detentions because one after school detention was not a deterrent. Another phone call is made, home is made by the, the teacher to the parent. Same conversation about what's going on, how can we prevent any further um, infractions. And at this point, they send that to me with the offense written down. Because now we're getting to the point where these behaviors are persistent and chronic, and so we want to make sure we're, we're targeting and, and tracking those offenses. And that student is then called into my office directly, regardless if it's one class or two classes. If they reach step four, they come to my office, and I sit and I con converse with them. And I may call them down again to try to make sure that we're making progress and follow up and check in and see how things are going, set up a plan. But then if they move to step five, um, if a student should move to step five, those low level behaviors, there have been nine interventions before a student moves to step five. You have five verbal warnings and four separate consequences. The one to one conversation, the letter home, the phone call home and after school detention, the phone call home and two after school detentions. There's been a lot of intervening taking place. 
And at some point, a teacher has to be able to say, I've done what I can do. I've done what I can reasonably be expected to do in a classroom. I'm going to teach the students that are here now, and I'm gonna pass it off to the office, to the dean of students, to Mr. Frame, and we're gonna to begin to figure out how we're gonna support this student because these interventions are ineffective. And I'll give you an example. When I taught at Mill Creek, after the uh, school-wide process that had been put in place when we opened the school, kind of disintegrated and balkanized, and everybody's kind of doing their own thing. They gave teachers the ability to assign lunch detention and after-school detention. Now, the after-school detention, the teachers had to monitor their own after-school detention. So guess what did not get assigned? After-school detention. And lunch detention became the default. You run in the hallway, you have lunch detention. You already see you have a lunch detention, lunch detention, lunch detention, lunch detention, lunch detention. We had 900 students in our school. We had three lunches, so about 300 students per lunch. And every single day at lunch, we had 100 students in lunch detention. One third of the school was serving lunch detention. And it got to be the point where students wanted lunch detention because that's where all their buddies were, right? And I remember I was trying to give this kid a lunch detention. I was like, we're going to have lunch detention on Monday. He's like, I already have lunch detention on Monday. OK, well, then I'm going to give you one on Tuesday. He's like, I have it on Tuesday, too. Well, what's Wednesday look like? And he looked at me and goes, I'm booked all week. <laughs> and I was like, oh. so what happened was, because it was a default and everybody was doing it, and kids had it, it lost its teeth. It had no meaning. It was a place they wanted to be. So what happened was we piloted in my team at Mill Creek, we piloted this process, this school-wide progressive discipline model, amongst the English, the language arts, science, social studies, and math teacher in our group. I was able to cut my lunch detentions by 50%. After school detentions kind of stayed the same because you had a step where there was one and two um, after school detentions. So you could sign three after school detentions in a semester and only one lunch detention. So the numbers kind of stagnated there, but it was because of the multiple opportunities to achieve after school detention. But once you learned a lunch detention and that didn't work, I wasn't going back to that. It wasn't effective. And so that's where we're at with this. And what we do is the teacher calls a code blue. The student is escorted to the focus center. <coughs> Mike gets on the phone, calls the parents, and we set up a behavior intervention team meeting. Would you like to talk about that for a minute? And, and what that meeting consists of is um, a staffing, basically, where we try to invite the teachers, if they can make it to come. Um, they bring in their PDM forms with all the documentation, uh, the behaviors that they've been having in the classroom and the issues they've been having. And we sit down with the parents, and we talk to them about what's going on with their child. We, we offer resources, again, like I said. And I, I think the biggest thing is getting that parent to come in and see that you know, we're willing to make a commitment to work with your child to keep them in school. Um, but like JP, I let him go forward with step five. But step, step five, it gets to the point where he said earlier the teacher can't actually teach at that point because of the, the consistent discipline, um, disruption that's been going on in the classroom, that we need to send a message. We need to do something different so that, that sort of has some value for the other kids in the classroom as well that they get to learn and, and get the instructional piece that they need. And we're working on that something different. This year, the goal is to imp implement the, the tier one interventions of PBIS at our school. We're not there. Everything we've accomplished to this point is strictly based upon the implementation of the school-wide progressive discipline model. The idea is, as it dovetails, it becomes a way for us to identify students that are going to be in need of more services than what we're providing in a universal intervention. And so this year, we're working on the school-wide universal where we have the matrix up in the hallway, in the classroom, in the restroom, in the cafeteria, in the parking lot. The school-wide intervention where you provide, this is how KM works, and 85, 80 to 85 percent of the students say, I got it, and they go, and they do it, and it's just fine. And then you got your 15 to 20 percent that for whatever are not responsive, we begin to give them like a check-in, check-out. So we're working on going beyond school-wide progressive discipline model, but we, we were working on getting this off the ground first. and so. Again, to talk about when you said, you know, allowing teachers to teach and students to learn. Education's a right, that's clear. It's a, it's a right globally, we've established that through Supreme Court cases, acts of Congress with Individuals, Disabilities and Education Act, it is a right. But I think that because it's such a new right, this is my own philosophy, you can agree or disagree with me, we haven't identified what the limit is. All of our other rights have limits. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom to assemble. They all have guidelines around those and responsibilities that come with them. We haven't established what that is with our schools yet, with our students yet. And the, the challenge is, if a student's violating the right of another student to learn, you can't just put them out on the street. They're kids. It may not be their fault. You know, if they're living out of a car, they, they're dealing with something that makes it difficult for them to function at school. 
And the worst thing you can do is remove them from the school environment where they're getting structure and food and care and put them back out on the street. So the goal here is to identify those students, those challenges, and begin to work with them and support them in that way. And I think that the school-wide progressive discipline model provides us a framework and a structure to begin to identify those students through the low-level discipline um, responses. Hey, JP, I know our time is like really short right now. Yeah. Um, we that transition to the next one. Could you just give them a, a quick update on the data? Let them know the success of, of that really quickly. Next slide. Perfect. So the blue form you have is our semester two PDM form. Every semester, students get a clean slate. We don't hold them accountable in, in June for behaviors they exhibited in October. If they move to step three and they figured it out, then why would we hold them accountable in the second semester? They may change classes as well. So the, <coughs> the first semester PDM <coughs> is on orange paper. The second semester is on blue paper, so teachers can easily differentiate between the two semesters in their record keeping. So a non-negotiable is that every student gets a clean slate at the semester break. So the data, what's the impact then? Looking at the data for this one, this is the big numbers. You have minus TTFY, TTFY, I'm sorry, and then the gross data. Now, what TTFYI means is truancies, parties, and FYIs. When we're looking at the data to compare apples to apples, it became necessary to remove some items from the data so we could look at it. For one, school-wide progressive discipline model does not address truancy. That's a school-wide behavior, not a classroom behavior. And truancy is a big one for us at our school. So we, we took that out. If you look on the back side of your form, you'll see that we use it to address tardies as well. So what happened was tardies referrals began to increase, and so it didn't match the data from 2013-14, so we took that out. FYIs also increased as a result of step three. More teachers are putting FYIs in. So when we take those three things out and we can compare 2013-14, the last year that we did not use school-wide progressive discipline model, to the most recent year, we're actually comparing apples to apples. So when you look, you can see that we don't have 2014-15. Uh, that's not included for two reasons. One, that's the year teachers did it voluntarily. It wasn't mandated school-wide. And two, I didn't want to clutter it with too much data. So we're looking at the last two years, 2015-16 and 2016-17 in yellow. And you can see with the minus target students is net wide, if you take 2013-14 and compare it to 16-17, we've been able to reduce office referrals by 62%. The 2015-16 data is compared to 2016-17 and we reduced it by 40%. Our gross data, now if you add everything in, that's anything, any behavior, any referral, We've been able to reduce them by one third, 32 percent. So, JP, real quick, um, we're supposed to be transitioning now, and I don't want people not to be able to go to their thing. But um, Pam has this PowerPoint, so it'll be accessible to everybody. And I encourage everybody that if you have any questions, to ask JP or ask Mike or ask myself. Um, or we've got the we've got the third session today as well. We're uh, again available the third session today if you want to come back and ask any more questions or hit the, at the end of the presentation. Sorry. I, we were a little late on the Thank you. Okay, one thing to look at. Yeah. Um, D plus D is defiance plus disruptive, but subjective. So we got results for defiance, we got results for disruption. What I did was add them together because what one teacher defines is defiant, another teacher might decide is disruptive. So adding them together, you get those numbers when you're looking at the data. And then next steps. We almost made it. Thanks for coming in, guys. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Rosa Villarreal, and I had the pleasure of hanging out with Tammy Unruh. I'm the principal at Kent Elementary. She's at Mill Creek. Um, I've had the opportunity to learn with her just a little bit, and I'll share a little bit about our journey. For me, it's a get started, get better mentality. Anything we're doing new on our campus, I say, let's just get started and get better. Part of what I'm hoping today is that we share a little bit about what we're doing to get started at Kent Elementary and then give that the lens of the blueprint. So again, we're a get started, get better. I never expect perfection, ever. We're gonna get started, get better. Um, taking the John Hattie um, visible learning framework, thinking about how our blueprint is accomplished with that work and because I'm an administrator, 
figuring how to think about TPEP at the same time. Therefore, I'm leveraging the research, the research of John Hattie, doing the work I gotta do around TPEP, and working towards the district goals. So those are the three pieces I try to put together and synthesize that for myself, and this is kinda how we went towards it at Kent Elementary. What you see on the uh, third bullet under menu for KE teaching and learning staff is the five areas that we've chosen. The first one, feedback, the effect sizes are all next to each of those topics. Feedback, we started in March at the late start. In February, we went to a training in March. I said, let's get started and get better. So in March, we started talking about feedback. I'll give you details about what we've done or what we will be doing. So the only one we've done so far at Kent Elementary is feedback. The other four are gonna be on the buffet this year at the school. So I invite you as I'm sharing less than 10, 12 minutes, uh, to think about your impact on learning based on some of this research. Okay, so quick, quick. In 09, Hattie became a name. He put out a, an analysis where he had looked at 800 studies, put out 135 effects. Two years later, he put out 150 effects, so he added 15. In 2015, he put out his third series where he added 400 more studies and then said, okay, now there's 195 effects. And now he's included the effects for higher education. That's good. So it's a lot of research. When we started with our team, we said, what the heck is visible learning? Well, it's about teachers seeing instruction through the eyes of their kids. What is the, what is the learning that's happening? But to me, more importantly, is the students seeing themselves as their own teachers. Because if we can have self-directed learners, that's a big work is done. Second part, that learning, we need to have a common definition of learning, right? Part of what Dr. Schmoker was saying today is, if you don't know, if you're not aligned and have common goals, there's no way you're gonna get there. So one of the things is, what's our common learning definition? So we had to talk about learning being, there's surface level learning, there's deep learning, and transfer learning. So, Lots of examples, I'm not going through them, but essentially surface level learning is like um, you sit in a class and learn how to drive. Uh, a deep level is that I can now go to any car and drive it. Transfer, I can go to any state and drive a car. So, again, lots of words. The crux of feedback is that you have to be super specific. Number one, do kids know what they're learning? They gotta have the goal. What am I doing? Number two, how do I get there? Number three, where am I going to next? Am I clear on what do I need to know? And how am I gonna get there? And what are my steps to get there? And that's the job of the teacher. So my job is to help her or him be sure that they know what do kids need to learn? What are the steps to get there? And can I teach processes to get there? Uh, Number four and five talk about it being just in time. And that's that monitoring piece where teachers are in their classroom and they're watching, and us as administrators, what do we see in teachers when they need just in time feedback for their work? Uh, in the bottom part, building a culture of feedback. One of the things we started this year, I know a lot of you have done it already, is the labs and studio work. Building that relational trust so that teachers are comfortable sharing ideas and sharing failure. I try to model failure. I'm happy to be wrong at any point in time. People ask me a question, I say, I don't know, let's get on the phone and we call somebody. So that's part of building relational trust from my lens. Three pieces or three types of feedback. Number one, you can give task-specific feedback, you can give process-specific feedback, or you can give self-regulatory feedback. Task, you can probably guess, is about a specific job. Process, something they're learning, big picture, and they're, you're missing a step in there. Self-regulatory is a very powerful one. You were working in a group, and you pulled away when you got mad. But I noticed two minutes later you rejoined the group, and the group was successful in their task. Why did that work? And letting them reflect on why they're being successful. Uh, the bottom, and what Hattie says basically is if you do those three kinds of feedback, you get the effect of feedback, which is 0.75, huge effect size. But if you do the kind of feedback that's the very last bullet, which is, great job, you're a good writer. It's too general, not 
specific, it's not task, it's not process oriented. This slide I'm kind of showing what I'm thinking as a leader. This is a picture, uh, an image I'll be using this year, haven't used it yet, uh, something we've done with teachers, and then something I'm gonna invite teachers to do this year more so, to get towards classroom discussion and better, more effective classroom discussions. So in terms of two-way meaningful communication, I'm going to be more clear about the first part, TFA is a teacher formative assessment. When uh, Hattie talks about teacher formative or formative assessments in general, he's saying that when, you, uh, when you're teaching, the before teaching and the during teaching feedback, when you're talking and looking and listening and assessing, that's teacher formative assessment. When you're looking at the next step, the common formative assessment, where the teachers have all met and they've planned and they've agreed, and they're writing assessments, common formative assessment. The interims, the IFAs, the interims are the ones the district asks us to do, for instance, at the elementary, it's early, I mean, I read We take the beginning, the middle, and the end of the year. And then your end of the year, some content areas will have end of years uh, or end of semesters, and then, uh, of course, our national test or the SBA. In terms of what we have done, we did a know your impact. We talked about if you're a high performer, high achievement, high progress, high achievement, low progress. If you're a low achievement, high progress, or a low achievement, low progress, every single staff member thinks about kids in terms of quadrants and why they're there. We ask classified as well as certificated staff to constantly think about this. And in what way, what specifically do you need to move students from one place to another? What do they need? In terms of supporting classroom discussion, point eight to effect, we're asking teachers to think deeply about questions. If you, uh, that's something Dr. Schmoker talked about this morning. If you develop a quality series of questions, kids can talk for a long time. If you ask open-ended, uh, analyzing, comparing, those are questions that kids can talk about for a long time, as opposed to very simple level one type questions. Uh, two other areas that align with goal three. So for being effective, this is something that came up in our uh, small group Schmoker discussion. Teacher clarity. Teacher clarity is do you know your learning target and do you know your success criteria? I can tell you that I'm 100% sure that in our building, every teacher does not put up a learning target and success criteria for every lesson. They do not. So that's part of my work this year, to continue to build that and to give the why. Second item, providing formative assessments. In terms of building formative assessments on our culture and our campus, we're gonna build the culture around this type of thinking. We're gonna ask teachers to know the standards in their common formative assessment, what number was it on your test, depth of knowledge. There's a new document we're gonna be using. Um, I should have put it on a document camera. But it's essentially a, a, a deconstructed standards document. They're available from the commoncoreinstitute.com. It kind of looks like this. Like here's a sixth grade sample. And what it does is it, and this is part of our discussion earlier that we were having, teachers do not know when they read a standard what depth of knowledge to teach that standard at. They don't know. I can read the standard, I can make a good guess. And we sometimes tell teachers, well, now we're going to do the hard work of deconstructing the standard. That's a lot of work. But there are documents where a lot of it's done. And so you can have the depth of knowledge at which the standards will be assessed already written out. Samples, the exact academic vocabulary that students need to be functioning in. It tells you what they learned the grade before and what they're going to learn in middle school. It aligns all of it for you. So that's part of the work we're doing this time. So last slide for goal four. Uh, mindset. The strongest predictor that Hattie has out there, the number one, some of us do a different ways mindset, but the number one thing is that students set an expectation. And the way he describes this is that you have to, as a teacher, you learn what everybody expects. You get them to set a goal, and then you inspire and help them to surpass the goal so that they gain confidence. So as a leader, 
We ask teachers to set SMART goals and success criteria for their, what they're going to be evaluated on. I have to help them, inspire them to get there and surpass them. So that their confidence builds and they help grow kids even more. Second part, um, love working with Jamie. I learned, we sat for maybe 30, 45 minutes. I learned more from her in those few minutes than I did at some of the, the Hattie trainings because she's lived it. So hanging out with people who know it. Reciprocal leadership development. My assistant principal that I have the great pleasure of working with, Rochelle, just our conversations. If you have those powerful conversations on your campus, you're blessed. I go out, I'm knocking on every door. We go together, hey, let's go visit this school. Let's go visit this principal. Because we're learning from all of you by going to your schools. And um, that's it. Team pet. And now my friend Tammy Andrew will share a few things about what she's doing. Remember, we're the get started, and she's the get better. I'm sure I visited. Um, and I'm sure that this presentation will change all of your lives, so you're welcome. Um, I got introduced, uh, I, I am by nature just somebody who kind of gravitates towards numbers and data. Um, I found that when you use data, people don't argue with you as much. It's kind of hard to dispute. And what's nice about Hattie is um, he, actually, he actually compiled 800 meta-analysis. So for those of you uh, that may not know what that is. Those are studies of studies. So literally in his work are over 8 million student samples. And his lens was, what, how does this impact student learning? Not that it's a good or a bad thing to do, not to say to stop that you should stop doing some of this stuff, because some schools need to do it even if it doesn't necessarily impact student learning. But that was his lens. What are all of these things that contribute to student learning? And he, he uh, divvied it out why stuff that the home contributes, right, which we don't really have any control of, uh, what the teacher contributes, what the school contributes. And so his original book really uh, breaks it down into those three areas, which I thought was really nice. And it also, for me, uh, helped focus my work because we know that there's a lot of stuff that goes on outside of our walls that we have absolutely no control over, but guess what? The stuff that impacts student learning the best is all stuff that we have control over. Um, and it's proven to work in many settings. And I think it really just kind of uh, supplements what Dr. Schmoker talked about this morning. So without further ado, um, when I first uh, started getting really uh, familiar with the work, I would often make observations, so either walkthroughs or official observations, and I would quote research in the write-ups. And I'm sure that that was life-changing for many teachers that got emails or write-ups from me. Um, I'm being sarcastic, it wasn't changing at all. Um, and so when we started doing PLCs, um, I would say probably in about year three, I went, oh, crud, this is how these two, two initiatives really fit together. Um, and so for you today, I'm gonna really kind of present Hattie through the lens of PLCs and how his research really supports the PLC cycle. Okay. So as we know um, with PLCs, everybody should know this hopefully, is the first thing that you want to do is really get clear about what you want kids to know and be able to do. And we know that that's a collaborative effort. Uh, uh, Dr. Schmoker talked about it being the guaranteed and viable curriculum, same thing. Well, what Hattie, and I'm going to run through some of these really quickly, um, because it actually, it's kind of a how-to, so if you want to use this with your teachers, I'd be happy to share. I can't take credit for it. My data guru, guru made this for me. Um, but if you see up here in this corner, what this gets to is teacher clarity. And again, if you're only vaguely familiar with Hattie's work, I call it the learning gas gauge. 
And what you want to do is focus on anything that is above this line. It's called the zone of desired effects. And the reason you want to focus in that area is because it has been proven to accelerate learning beyond one year. So you really want to focus, when you talk about high leverage strategies, you want to do anything that's over a 0.4. Um, this is actually reverse effects. This right here is developmental effects, meaning if you are a living in a world, no education at all, you're going to get a year smarter just from living and experiencing life. And this is teach, just plain teacher effects. So those are all the kind of normal stuff that teachers do in a year. And so anything above that is the high leverage. Just out of curiosity, can anybody guess what the uh, reverse, the number one reverse effect is? Um, close. That's probably the second one. Retention is definitely, um, it's, I think it's the second one up on the rung. Um, mobility, right? That's not shocking. Kids move around and they, and they don't, um, they don't retain their knowledge. So anyway, this is teacher clarity. It's a high impact strategy. It makes sense. If teachers are very clear about what they want and want kids to know and be able to do, um, then they can tell kids what they want them to know and be able to do. They can formatively assess them while they're teaching them, and then they can reteach as necessary. Kind of simple but complex at the same time. Um, that's the same graphic there. Uh, common formative assessments, right? And that's the next part in the cycle when you talk about after we've defined what those learning targets are, those essential standards or the guaranteed and viable curriculum, whatever educational word you want to use for it. Once you've defined that, then you guys have to decide how are you gonna, or how you're gonna assess that kids go through it. And I will tell you, from my personal experience in now two different schools, teachers are really good at question number one. They love to talk about what they want kids to learn. And they're pretty decent at number two. How are we gonna assess them? But getting them onto questions three and four is really tough, right? Because their whole teaching world is in one and two. Teach it, assess it, teach it, assess it. And we know that learning takes place more in the three and the four questions. So um, the common formative assessments, when we're doing them well and we respond to them, those are also a high leverage strategy. As you'll see, the arrow is above that middle line where we want it to be. Um, doo -doo -doo. OK, uh, so progress monitoring. Um, this is another thing. So this is common formative assessments, which is different than uh, it's on a different rung in the Hattie work than just formative assessments, obviously because of the word common. And although formative assessment is really good, you'll see the common is actually, formative assessment is about right here, common formative assessment is right here. So if you can't work with somebody else, formatively assessing students is still a really good thing to do. But when you do it as a group, a functional group, you get a little bit more bang for your buck. And um, I use this actually with teachers, especially the grumpy ones that don't want to necessarily collaborate. Their classroom is their domain. And the fact of the matter is, is no one person knows it all for every single kid. It's just not gonna happen. And so um, this has really helped me make the case with teachers about, sorry, I know you don't like to play nice with others, but you need to. And tell your when your classroom is 100% meeting standard, then I will excuse you from this work. But until we get to that point, the research is just super clear about needing to do it together. Um, more on the how, the data collection. So one thing that um, I do with the formative assessment is I have every single department make a, a 30, a 60, and a 90 day academic goal that's related to the essential learnings. Uh, and they're supposed to commonly, common formatively assess and then they report their data. Um, and what we have them report is how many met standard, how many SPED students who are serviced in SPED met standard and ELL. And then they also have to report what their next steps are so that there has to be a response to whatever that data was. Um, and it goes into, I have the pleasure of using Indostar, but all of that is uploaded into Indostar. And it's not because, um, I mean, it does help me keep an eye on the learning in my building as well as the teaching, but it's really that kind of mutual accountability piece so that we can say we're doing PLCs and we can say that we're uh, performing at a high level, but 
if you're not completing the cycle or the data is not flushing out, you can't really say that. So um, it's been transformative, but I will tell you it's labor intensive work and I do compensate my data managers for it because I have one person in every single content area that compiles the data and reports it out to the leadership on a quarterly basis. Uh, this is just a sample of what that looks like. So every 30 days is I get these PowerPoints from each curricular area like this and it depends. This one I think is one is for seventh grade math and one is for eighth grade math. And I think this standard is uh, the one and two step equations. But anyway, I get a nice sneak peek. It's um, given to me as overall. So this is how seventh grade did and then it's broken down by class and then it's broken down by other other uh, specialty areas that we like to look at. Dun, 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 dun. The next steps, I already talked about that. Action plan, and then it starts all over again. So yeah, that's, that's all I have. Questions? We tried to move through this fast because we originally thought we were going to have an hour, so we really whittled it down to see if, yes, Shannon. Are your data managers in lieu of your curriculum leaders? No, they are not. They're in addition to. They're in addition to. Um, the contract is very clear about what you can have your curricular leaders do, and that's not one of the things that they can do. If Sometimes I have a curricular leader that's also a data manager, but it's still two separate things. So I've either just dazzled you with my knowledge or completely bored you to sleep. It's hard for me to see with the light, so I'm going to go with dazzled. Um, I, again, that PowerPoint is more set up kind of to make the case with teachers, so if you would like it, the clips and stuff are already ready for you. I, you could take it and make it yours if you're having some, some need to make the case with teachers about why to do this, engage in this work. Happy to share. If you've got something better, happy to take. Yeah. Do most of your teachers connect their, their overall, their individual student growth goals to the third grade? Yes. Naive. Yes. I, I don't instruct them to, but I strongly recommend it. And my, the reason I recommend it is because why would you do double work? We're doing this as a building anyway, so it seems silly. And I've had a couple of teachers choose not to, and that's fine. And then the next year they go, well, that was dumb. I think I'm just going to do this. All right. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Don't necessarily want to stand up here, but I think they need the microphone to be close to me to because they're filming it. So, um, so a caveat, a lot of this is something that probably will not come as a shock. These are strategies that have been around for a while. Um, but one of the objectives of this is that you can take this presentation and head right out and do it with your staffs back uh, in your work locations pretty easily. The actual uh, PowerPoint has notes on it, so if you need to follow notes around there, if you're presenting to your staff, then um, please do so. This is located, we've just created a team site specifically for discipline. Yeah, and so you were given all given access to that yesterday. If you need access for like deans of students, interns, for some of your clerical staff, uh, let our office know. Lori Medeo is the one who does it, and she can give them access. And all the things around discipline, like all those tap, you know different documents I've sent out around the matrix and other things like that, they'll all live there. So the latest versions will always be there for you to find. So that's that's where, and any resources like this, where I have presentations and stuff like that, will be put there as well, so that you can all find it in one location. There is a handout up here if people are coming in and want to uh, grab a handout to follow along. These handouts are also on the same location if you're doing it with your staff. So, have you ever felt like bringing a megaphone into the classroom and using it when because you, your kids won't be quiet? Hopefully not. Um, although, true story, when I was a sixth grade teacher, I heard a loud noise coming from a room across the hallway. I rocked across the hallway, and the teacher in there had brought in a megaphone because uh, her class wouldn't be quiet and was, was using it to talk to her students. Obviously, she was struggling a little bit with classroom management, um, and, it, and the megaphone didn't work. Okay. 
So today you'll learn how to keep your cool, connect with your students, and carry out positive discipline and create a calm, safe classroom. So keep your cool. That's what you got to remember. Kids don't learn from uh, people that they don't uh, that that they don't like. Um, anyone ever seen the YouTube video by Rita Pearson? If you haven't, look it up. It's actually a very cool video. She's a, a former educator. Um, and one of the things that a lot of people don't like to admit, she admits in that, which is we don't like all of our students. Uh, there are some students that we just don't like very much. But that's, those students should never know that you don't like them. So um, uh, that relationship uh, key piece is, is right there. And she reiterates it over and over again that relationships are key. And when both of us who have been doing this for a while know that. Okay, so it's going to be a chance to turn and talk in just a moment here. I want you to imagine in your mind one student that you've had a good relationship with. And what were the qualities of that relationship? What made that relationship good? Now also I want you to think about a student that you have not had such a great uh, relationship with and talk, think about the qualities that are part of that relationship. So think about that for a minute, and then when you have those two in mind, turn and talk next to a neighbor, and if you have to do groups of three, that's fine too, and share both the one you had a good quality, you know, one with, and the good qualities and the bad. So go for it. Try to wrap up your conversation. Okay, would someone like to share, okay, remain without names of the students, but share the one, the, the one around what qualities of the relationship were with the one that was a good relationship? The ability to empathize. I think it responded well to a sense of you showed them empathy, and they responded to that, and were able to build a relationship with them. Okay, how about one that didn't go so well? If anyone can, can, and you never were able to kind of crack that nut and and, and get to a good spot with this kid. Um, what are kind of the qualities of that relationship? Anyone want to share? Lack of trustworthiness, just being honest about very basic things. Okay, and is that? That you couldn't get them to trust you, or that you couldn't trust them, or both? That I couldn't trust them. OK. You couldn't trust them, and then do you think that kid probably would have said the same thing about you? Sure, probably. Right. And that there was a lack of trust, and that was damaging the relationship and not getting it to the where it needed to be. Anyone else? Yeah. Right. Uh, when uh, possibly a student feel that the relationship uh, is, is based on rules, you want to expand on that? <laughs> so rather than doing right, it, it, rather than doing uh, the right thing for the right reason, do it because of the rules. Okay. As opposed to understanding. So the rules were more important than the 
my story or my situation or who I am as a person. It all comes back to the rules. Okay. All right. Okay. So here's the deal. I hate to tell you this, but you have triggers. Uh, and we all have triggers, and nobody's perfect here. And there are certain behaviors that trigger that for certain people, you just can't go it over. Uh, I know I have a couple I will share with uh, you one, uh, but I want you to once again turn to your neighbor and do you know what your triggers are? What are the things that you just don't have very much patience for? Let's, let's keep it focused on students, not like say your, your, your loved one or, you know, or other people outside of, uh, out of the school setting. So with students, what are some triggers that they display that you just have very little patience for? Conversation. Anyone willing to share with us your trigger? Lack of respect. Lack of respect. When the student shows lack of respect, that's a trigger. Anyone else? Anyone else want to share their trigger? Yeah. That it triggers. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm always wanting to to try to figure out what the student needs, you know? And when they don't share either by writing or talking or acting it out, whatever, you know, it's really, I really find that annoying. When they shut down and just won't give you anything. Yeah, all right. Uh, for me, my personal one that used to get me with kids is when they blamed everyone else in the world for what was going on and not taking any ownership of the behavior at all. That was a trigger for me. Uh, and it's like, seriously, this is the 14th time we've talked about this and it's always other people's fault. So, so we all have them. These are some common ones right there. Ones who lie, cheat, whine, uh, refuse, interrupt, roll. Notice it says roll her eyes. Uh, guys don't do that. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, by the way, I, I, I don't know if I said it earlier. I didn't create this, this uh, PowerPoint. This was actually created by the Committee for Children. I want to give ownership to who it is, but they said we can use it out in our schools and they want it being used. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and these describe behaviors. And, and I think what, sometimes what we get caught up in is assigning motivation behind those behaviors that are often incorrect. Correct. And actually, yeah. Uh, that's where you're going, and I'll just. Yes, right, exactly. So, but one of the things, though, is if we know that certain behaviors trigger a response in us, understanding what that response is. So hopefully it's not that response up there. Uh, but think back to when, when kids have displayed these triggers, what is it the response that you sometimes do that uh, you're not always real proud that, about the way that it comes out because you know that it doesn't work, but yet you fall into that trap and sometimes uh, do it anyway. So um, things, since we're short on time, things that are common include yelling, ignoring, glaring, punishing, lecturing. Uh, I would fall into the lecture uh, mode a lot, and then I'd look over and they'd have to totally tune me out. It was, you know, they had no, so it didn't work. Most of these tend to not work in the moment when you're reacting to your own triggers. So knowing what your response is is part of that as well because Knowing your triggers and then knowing your responses 
helps you to plan your response. And that is so important when you're going into a situation, especially um, to have a plan. Because when we don't have a plan, that's when we make poor choices. Um, you know, Tim Kovich and I have had these conversations with safety officers around um, needing to, when they're called for a response, oftentimes, you know, what they're being called to are things that they've encountered before. So when they've encountered, you know, it, it's, it's so important to have a plan, and that goes for administrators as well. Oftentimes you're called into situations that are ongoing and happening right now. And so making sure you have a plan of how you're gonna react. So let's say it's a kid that is refusing. Let's say it's a kid that's refusing to take their hat off, and the school rule is that you cannot wear hats because it is disruptive to the school environment. I still don't quite understand that, uh, but, Apparently it is. Um, and so it's really important for this kid to take this hat off. And so you need to understand when you're going to respond to something like that. And if that's the situation, what's my plan? If I know my, the district plan uh, guidelines say, we don't suspend for dress code violations. And dress code violations are not defiance issues. I need a plan going in there that what happens if this kid blatantly tells me to my face, no, I'm not gonna take the hat off. Because probably that's already happened when the teacher or the staff member already asked them and they said no, and that's why you're being called to do that. So having a plan when you're going to respond is very important. And if you know that, okay, I'm not gonna suspend for this, then my plan is I'm gonna deliver my message. And then I'm probably gonna have to, if they don't comply, just let it be and then deal with that as a consequence later after the whole situation has de-escalated. So, you know, if, if my plan is I'm gonna drag this kid down to the office and then call the parents and kick them out of school, who has caused the greater disruption right there? The kid that is wearing the hat or us who have just dragged this kid down the hallway and suspended them out of school for something? You could still deliver a consequence later on after you've delivered the message and they've refused but you've not gotten into this whole power struggle and had this thing blow up. So having and planning your response is very important. If you find yourself in a heightened state, then you need to do things to calm yourself down or get yourself away from that situation so that you don't make um, not good choices. Now, remember, once again, I'm talking to you as administrators today, this is a presentation that you can come back and do with various different groups within your school. So if you're training your recess supervisors at the beginning of the year and giving them this presentation, you can tailor it to them and uh, have them understand what are your big issues, what are your smaller issues. This is not something you wanna you know, uh, make a giant deal about and this one is, is something. So um, we don't have time to do that. This is a point where you could in the thing have them role play some situations and, and discuss, but we don't have time for that. Okay, here's the deal. You've done all the things, you know your triggers, you've got a plan, you've tried to work it all out, still didn't work because the challenging behaviors remain. How many people have had that happen to them? Yeah, I think we all have. Okay, that's because sometimes, so often we're really not getting at the root of the behavior. And I'll tell you, one of um, the first professional development needs we're gonna be hitting around multi-tiered systems of support, and we're all already arranging this, this training, is to try to get at least one administrator and one other person from each school trained in functions of behavior. It is, uh, we've identified that through our work with the schools this year, that there's a lack of knowledge around functions of behavior. And the problem with having that lack of knowledge around functions of behavior is oftentimes we are employing consequences that have nothing to do with the behavior that is being displayed. And in fact, the consequences that we're employing are actually making the issues bigger instead of actually addressing the issues. So um, really trying to get at the root of the behavior is um, what this is all about. When I was a principal, we had um, the district program for autistic kids at our, our school, and we were having lots of problems with them hitting and assaulting our staff members. And so we were able to hire this uh, autism specialist out of Portland who came and did some observation. Da, da, da. He, most of these autistic kids were nonverbal, and you know he he brought to our attention 
This is, the behaviors that they are doing, they are communicating with you because they are not able to communicate. This is the way they're communicating. So you have to find out when they are hitting staff members, what is it that they're trying to communicate? What are they trying to tell you? And then he said, I'll never forget this. And I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, and as an aside, all your other students in the school, when they're displaying certain behaviors, they are also trying to communicate something to you. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Okay, um, because a lot of kids are not going to come right out and tell you what's going on. They're um, trying to communicate to you with their behaviors, and it's our job as adults to try to figure out what it is that they're trying to communicate. So the other thing is you need to change your frame. People need to change their frame and take the behavior and not connect it to the kid. And so instead of saying the student is a problem, really looking at what is the student's experience uh, in his or her life. That is, that is causing these behaviors. What's wrong with this student? What is the student trying to say? So you can help do this by doing, using this frame with any staff member that comes to you as well. And if they come in and say, I'm so sick of this kid, this behavior, yeah, this, this kid is, you know, uh, try to reframe it for them. So what behavior, so what do you think it is they're trying to tell us? What about this behavior? What are, uh, what supports are we not giving to this student that we need to be giving this student? We're always trying to reframe it into the positive. Okay, and remember this, for every adult who works in a school, the only behavior you can control is your own. I don't care if it's a three-year-old in our preschool or an 18-year-old. Human beings uh, and their brain and the way they work, they're the only ones who can control what they're doing. So no matter how much we want to control a student's behavior, we can't. We can only control how we respond to the behaviors that are there. And then hopefully how we respond will influence how um, the student responds. So you're supposed to go, ah, right there when you see two babies. OK. Are you an unfeeling group? Uh, OK. Jeez. OK. Oh, okay. Do we have nothing but secondary people here? No, just kidding. Uh, Choose a supportive response. Listen, show empathy, provide support. That's what these students are looking for. Um, and then that helps you to connect. Filling the relational bank account is so important. Um, and what we're talking about relational bank, bank account is, we talked about earlier, kids learn from people they like and they think like them. And those with good relationships with them, they respond to better. That has to be an intentional thing on our part, especially with kids we know are going to struggle. You have to build up those relational um, bank accounts. Ways that you can do it, recognition, positive reinforcement, compliments, interest, care attitude, choice. These are some examples of those. So they've done studies that one of the most pleasing sounds to a person is their own name. So, um, and that's why successful salespeople, if you've ever been dealing with, what do they do a lot? They use your name. You know, I, 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 this last year I bought a car, and I'm thinking back to that interaction, and that salesperson constantly was using my name, learned it right away, was using it. It's a technique that they know, the salespeople know, and we should, we should pick up on as well. So instead of just saying good morning to a student when they walk in the door, if you know their name, use the name. Good morning, Andrew. How are you today? Um, it is very pleasing to them. Positive reinforcement. You put a lot of effort into that project. Don't just say good job. You need to be specific about what it is that you are praising them for. Um, because they will, good job on what? Maybe just a second before what they had just, that you were, praising, what they, you were praising them for, maybe a minute before that, they were saying some smart alecky remark to a friend. And maybe they think, that's what you appreciated. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, all right, I'll do that again. You might be reinforcing the wrong thing. Be specific about what you're uh, reinforcing. Compliments. Be as specific as possible. That was a really creative idea. No one has come up with that idea all day long, and we've been talking about these things all day long. Interest. If you know that they do something on the weekend, don't just say, how was your weekend? Say, hey, how'd that football game go this weekend? How was that music recital this weekend? That shows interest in the, uh, that, that you care. Gratitude, but once again, being specific. Thank you for specifically what they did. Uh, and choice. Those of you who figured this out, oftentimes you can get what you want 
and still give them a choice by giving them the choice that ends up being the same thing. So, hey, would you like to start uh, get your work done right now, or would you like to go get a drink of water and then come back in and get working? Okay, you've, you've accomplished the same thing. The kid is going to start working, but you've given them a choice as to how they do it. And everybody likes choice. Uh, so that's an example. Here's the bad news for you out there, that positives and negatives are not a one-to-one -one ratio. Wish they were, it would be great, it would be a lot easier to do. The fact of the matter is you need five positive interactions to counteract one negative interaction. And if it is a really kind of bad interaction, you're probably gonna need more than five positives to interact, uh, to, to get past that on. So that's why smart educators start building up those positives right away from the day they walk in the door or the day they walk on the bus or wherever they do. They are banking all those by using some of the strategies we talked here and getting as many in their bank as possible, knowing that at some point, um, some point, they're gonna have to take a withdrawal from their piggy bank there and do that. It also means though, that you have to have a really specific um, plan for when a negative interaction has occurred to build back your bank account afterwards. And you have to be very intentional about making those, those positives. Uh, so, don't have time to try it out. But, does anyone have an example of how maybe they did this in a particular situation with a particular kid? Or, All right, and it's your challenge out there to go out and practice this what's mine. Um, one of the things we'll often hear from uh, people is, oh, I don't have time to do the positive there. I'm teaching a class, I've got things to do, da 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 da. We problem solved this with our elementary counselors a little bit. We did this presentation with them, and they were coming up with ideas. They're a creative group. Uh, that, um, well, maybe I could go in and I could start, you know, if, and um, look for the positives for the teacher and then like cue them when, you know, so I'll, I'll concentrate on this kid that needs positives and I'll go in there and I'll watch for it like and I'll cue when I see something and then the teacher can come over and I can tell them real quick quietly and they can go over and praise the student for it. And I thought that was a great idea because then it kind of took away the argument that, well, I don't have the time or I'm doing this. And it also modeled, it will model to the teacher that, oh, the kid is doing positives throughout the day uh, that I've been missing and um, they will feel more confident in doing it from that point on. So um, there are all sorts of creative ways that you can go about doing that. Um, so I don't really have time to go through that. Um, so just realize challenging behaviors will happen, okay? Um, so getting ready for the conversation. These are the things when you're having a conversation about discipline with a student, one-to-one, -one, this is away from the situation after you've gotten them back like into the office and you're having a conversation about what happened. You need to create safety. And it talks about how you create safety there, um, within there. The kid is not gonna open up to you if they don't feel safe in the situation. If the power dynamic, you bring them in, they're sitting on a chair and you're standing over them like this. That's not a safe situation for them to really share with you what they did. Uh, you know, if you can, sit at their level, have an open response to them, let them know this is a safe place for them to share, and that you are actually really interested in hearing their side of the story. So you don't start out the conversation, and I hear you did this, 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 and this. You open up with, let me hear what, you know, what your side of what this is going on. Show curiosity. Remember, behavior means something. So ask questions that try to get to that. But don't do it like, you need to tell me why you did that. I know there's a behavior, there's a reason, you're trying to communicate something to me. What is it? Tell me now. Uh, that's not a very, that's not curiosity. Uh, you know, you're, you need to be more subtle about that. Um, provide support, show empathy, like you said earlier. Um, respond in a neutral, non judgmental way. Even if they say something kind of shocking uh, in what they say, don't, overreact and say, oh, that's terrible, you know, or like my, 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 my dad hit my mom last night and walked out the door, oh, that's awful, I, you know, and react that way. 
show empathy at that point and say, wow, that must have been a very scary situation for you. Uh, you know, is, is your mom all right? Da, 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 you know, those types of things. So show that you care. And then distinguish um, the behavior from the child. We need to always move that away, okay? I am under the belief that there's no really evil children out there. That's, that's uh, you know, when uh, I've had parents say, well, talking about another, not their own kid. That 10-year-old is evil. They're, this kid is gonna be a psychopath and gonna end up in prison. Well, I'm not ready to give up on a 10-year-old, I'm sorry. Um, I think there's a lot we can still do um, to do that. So keep the behavior away from the child. Um, and then this is a conversation guide with a checklist to help you remember to do the things that you need to do in order to make those conversations. Connect with the student, understand what happened from the child's perspective, explore any harm caused. That harm could be to the relationship between you and the child, it could be a harm to the child themselves, it could be ch uh, harm to their classmates, but explore what that harm is and then think about ways that you could, they could make amends for the harm. Um, go back on the social skills. So like if you're using a social skills curriculum, try to access what they've just learned. So if in third grade you know that they learn strategies on uh, problem solving, employ those and say, hey, you just learned some skills around how to do this, do this. If they haven't, teach them some skills. Uh, apply consequences to the problem and communicate with families and follow up. Okay. How much time do we have? You know? Five, minutes. Five minutes? Okay. So um, the key is having enough tools in your, your tool belt with the discipline tool belt. And the, ra the reality is a lot of times we have the tool we need, we just forgot we had it. That happens to me a lot. Unfortunately, I have a Lowe's right across the street from me. So when I can't immediately find the tool that I was looking for, what do I do? I just run across the street and buy another tool. And then I find the one that I had before and now I have two of the same tool. But that's all right. Uh, but it's around reminding people that they have the tool. Nothing I showed you today is revolutionary and new. It's all things you've probably heard before at some point in your education, but we need to re-access it with people. Um, just to let you know, this is kind of a fun site. Mind Yeti, if you've never been there, is around mindfulness, meditation. Uh, yeah, there's, there, are free le there are free things on Mind Yeti, and then there's a subscription that you can pay for that has a more intensive and extensive. But there's a lot of people that are looking at this. And instead of having, before having conversations with kids about their behaviors, they actually put them through like a three minute meditation type or a mindfulness thing to get them calmed down to the spot where they're ready to have the conversation. We've heard about people using it like from on transitions. If you're coming back from an assembly at a secondary school or from recess at an elementary school, a three minute mindfulness, you know, it's like sitting, feel your body, you know, getting heavy, you know, you're relaxed, you're moving from one thing to the next. It helps to transition kids. Um, so, Hopefully now you need to know how to do these things right here. Uh, and um, remember this presentation and the handouts are on the discipline team site. Okay, and so any emails that I send you as reminders about discipline, I'll just be linking it right to that team site. So you'll always have, Tom's happy. Uh, so that you'll always have the most up-to-date versions of all the discipline things, including like suspension letters and the matrixes and uh, the policies and procedures that you'll need around discipline. So, any questions on any of this? All right. Okay. session for a 35 minute breakout session to let me say the ones that I've uh, had the opportunity to visit and what I've heard from those that I did not, examples of a practicing quality organization, a learning organization are happening right before our eyes. So we want to thank each and everyone who's contributed and those who will contribute more in the future. I'm going to pass the microphone to Ralph Fortunato, who will share a little bit more about what I referenced this morning. I think I shared with you, we would be 
Uh, continuing this conversation right now, it is one way. There will be more opportunities for two way. We want you to be equipped with some information that is more detailed relative to the conversation uh, and the presentation I shared today with a few questions in mind. One, where are we? What's our current status? Two, where do we need to be as an organization? Three, what barriers currently exist that are hindering our progress to get there sooner rather than later? Now, keep in mind, when I say sooner rather than later, it implies that we are going to get there together. And the plan that I have in place that you will hear more about uh, from Ralph details once we've identified the problem. Remember, it's not what happened, it's how we respond. And so our response to that will be in development. Mr. Fortunato, I'm gonna pass the mic to you for more detailed information about the plan going forward. Ralph? Okay, so um, the plan going forward. Well, we're looking at pretty much everything, Mike and myself and the rest of the team are looking at everything pretty much ser seriously. Lisa's not here today because we're basically blowing up the budget and basically starting all over again. So there will be some changes going on. We'll probably have to do a re budget revision in November. Don't know what all that entails yet. Um, we're working on the salary pieces, we're working on MSOC pieces, we're working every, everywhere. So today, we're going to talk about running the fiscal gauntlet to success. It's probably more of a nuts and bolts thing that we, that we talked about. We, um, when, we, when the call for presentations went out, we, we kind of talked about the office, what we want to, something we always want to do. I could ask poetically about debits and credits, and I can. And I'm sure you guys will really like that. I did bring a little prop with me. So it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. We're talking accounting and accounting uh, procedures. If I say the same people falling asleep, I'm going to stop the horn, okay? So don't fall asleep. <laughs> so today we're going to uh, talk about some accounting uh, procedures. Don't fall asleep, okay, okay guys. Uh, purchasing to payroll employee recognition, the new procedure and policy went into effect last year to review that. Travel, my all time favorite right now, food and beverage per purchases, uh, district fundraising, and mention some other policies for you there. And we have a lot to cover. Here's 150 slides here. 36, okay? So, so 36 is under, we have to 150. But one thing I want to cover on this here is that I have a stack about this big on my, on my desk about, I have several stacks about that big on my desk, but I have a stack this big of audits that happen across the country and things that happen in other school districts. And sometimes I call it the, the there before the grace of God file. <laughs> and one of them I really liked, my all time favorite was, there was a food service worker, I think she was in Ohio, and over the course of six years, she stole $1.6 million. That's $1,667 a day. And she did it by stuffing the money in her bra. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But anyway, that's the kind of things that if we follow proper policy procedures, we don't get those headlines. So where you can find them, all of our uh, uh, forms and our uh, policies, go to staff link and go to department resources, and you click on the name, whether it be accounting, or finance, budgets, payroll, and purchasing, you'll see the forms, you'll see procedures there, or you can go to the forms tab. One thing in accounting, you'll, you'll discover, and I just, you know, we love forms. Okay, we love forms. We we'll have all the forms there. And also on the school board agendas, and policies and procedures, under category 6,000, all the management support ones are there. So you want to see the procedure about fundraising. You want to see the procedure about um, gifts. You want to see the procedure about food, food policy and procedure. They're all right there. Go to, go to 6,000. So let's look at some policies and features that deal with the county. Here are your contacts for you. Uh, Julie couldn't be here today. Um, she's the county supervisor. And there's the rest of the staff for you. First of all, all payments are processed. We do the warrants once a week, 
we do on Thursdays. And for those payments that happen on Thursday, they have all the invoices must be into accounting by five o'clock on Monday. So the checks are run on Thursday that week. If there's a Monday holiday, the cutoff is Friday at five o'clock. Occasionally, now one thing I want to point out on, on this PowerPoint slide, anytime you see a bold, italics, an underline, that's kind of an important thing. So, so occasionally, there's a need of, you've got to get the payment out, I forgot to send it in, or we need, to, we need these pay for people as soon as possible, call Julie at 7227, and she can walk you through that. Nine times out of ten, we can probably do it only if it's on occasion. And within the next week, ten days, information on 2016, 17, year end close will be uh, for submitting invoices and other cutoff information will be sent out soon. Cash receipting requirements. When I first came to the district about 14 years ago, I, did, I was doing some cash receiving, and I couldn't believe just how much cash runs through a school, particularly at the high school. We take, we take the bank cards now, which alleviates some of that, but it was just an eye-opening for me. For me. So if deposits to the bank are to be made a minimum of once a week, even if it's $5, or sooner if the total received, which is $500 or greater. So a lot of schools, particularly this time of year, probably for the next two months, you would make making deposits every, every day. And that's really for your own, your own um, protection. Probably about eight, 10 years ago, there was one school that didn't do deposit for four months, they hit over $5,000 if they're safe. That just puts you guys in a lot of liability. We found checks sometimes that are two and three years old that never been deposited. That's money that hasn't has gone there. So this is the kind of thing we're, we're forming up. Deposit should be reviewed by at least two people. Should be signed by the principal or department manager or somebody they have designated. So two people need, need to look at that deposit slip. And again, it's for your own protection. If it goes to the bank, and banks make mistakes, we all know that. But um, they don't think so, but we, we know they do. But the deposits, the deposits have said $1,000, and the bank says only $900 was deposited. We're coming back and asking where that, where that $100, $100 is. And if, only, if only one person did it, there's no way of knowing that. So two people need to uh, sign off and prepare to uh, check, check the deposit. The monthly cash receipts reports are due to accounting the first working day at the end of the month. And donation agreements need to be completed for all donations and gifts. And for those who are $250 or more, they need to be accepted by the board. Good idea. Don't spend the money first before we before the board actually accepts, accepts it. Because if we'll say, some, say there was a lot of strings attached to the donation, and for some reason the board didn't want to accept that donation, and you already spent the money, well, you're going to have to give that money back to them. Just like I said, buildings, for example, if you get a reimbursement, say, for example, a field trip expense was reimbursed by the zoo, they say, if you come, we'll, we'll pay for you to come. Um, there's a billing uh, form, a billing request form, which they have to fill out. And the reason why we have that form is so that a county can properly record and track all the payments due to the district and making sure that it comes back to the budget where it should go, particularly after school or your department. We get checks sometimes. We go, where does this go? Who belongs to this? It takes like, maybe a month or two to figure out who gets, who actually should, we should accredit those, those funds. So if we had that building request form filled out, we would, we would know exactly where, where, where it should go. Asset management, inventory control. Principals and department managers are responsible for the assets, tag items, that's, that's your tag items, that'd be your computers, uh, anything that has an inventory tag item, you're responsible for that, for anything in your building. And a physical inventory and binding will be sending those sheets out real soon. Um, she's really good about that. And required annually. And it's important to keep track of your assets. And, make, and if they're moved from classroom to classroom, or if they move from building to building, or from, um, you need to be aware of that and a market on that so we can then t um, track, track those items. Lost or stolen items need to be reported as soon as you know it. And see, they're tossing money too, if you lose if money is, uh, is stolen. Any loss, we have to report to the state auditor. One year, I think it was a Camarilla tractor got stolen out of, out of the shed. We have to report to the state auditor. If there's a, if there's a lot of um, that going on, the state auditor will have to come in and do, do an investigation. And we do have on the website, the county website, uh, reporting. There's a form and there's a process of flow chart for, for reporting any loss of, di of district property. 
purchasing. Here are your contacts, Hal's here today. Purchase it for less than $300, you can use your fee card, of course, and they're encouraged, and purchase order is now required. For purchases $300 to $2,000, the fee card is encouraged. You don't need a purchase order to use your fee card, except for those separate books, furniture, equipment, for which a fee card is required, a fee purchase order, excuse me, purchase order is required for those items. Federal funds. You're dealing with the feds. There is, I don't know, hope that they're, hi, Rana. Um, you know, federal funds, they have a lot of restrictions. $3,000 or $75,000, three documented quotes. Document, document, document. Make sure you have your quotes. They can be phone quotes, they can be written quotes, they can be, um, but before you buy anything, you need to show that you're getting the best deal. For non-federal funds, that's everything else. Uh, 10 to, 10 to 40,000, three quotes are recommended. I should underline and italicize and bold that one. So three quotes are get get three quotes. And purchases of forty thousand to seventy-five, three quotes are required. And anything more than seventy-five thousand dollars, a formal bid process is required. And in Howland purchasing can definitely help help you with that. Those are our, our those are the requirements. And here is a little matrix for you. This is all the, this, this this presentation will be posted on on the website. Um, Pam's, Pam's booth posted this. There will also be um, handouts too, which gives more detail. And if I did all those stuff that's on those handouts, it would be 150 slides. So there's more detail for, for, for you there. Basically, anything over 75,000 is a formal bid process, which is advertising for it, which is uh, opening the sealed bids and everything. Now, there are some exceptions to competitive bidding. Textbooks are exempt from competitive bidding by at RCW. <laughs> And primarily because of the very nature of, of curriculum. And sometimes we have emergencies, which um, competitive bidding process may be waived. Remember, about four or five years ago, we had the fire at KM about this time of year, and uh, the school board declared an emergency, so we um, so we get the construction work down when it was done within a month or so. If you went through the bidding process, it'd be about a month just to go through the bidding process. Let's talk about one of my favorite subjects here, sole sourcing. Basically, the federal government and most auditors believe that sole sourcing really doesn't exist. Because a sole source is that supplier is the only one in the world where you can buy that from. And one thing that comes to mind is uranium. You can only buy it from the federal government. That's your sole source. So if anyone here buying uranium, okay? <laughs> I guess you can get it from Liberia too. You got yellow tape, remember that one? Uh, but anyway, um, uh, so, it's, so it's very rare. Now, how do you determine if something is a sole source? Well, normally you would send out an RFP. Okay. Well, if only one, so you did your, you did your due diligence, and if only one replied, well, that's fine. Then that's the one you want to go with. That's fine. That's still that's not a sole source. So, so there's some rule, rules around it. It's it kind of complicated. But um, make sure you document, you have all your information with you. You have your RFP, you have who you who was sent to. And again, how the purchasing can help, 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 help you with that. And contracts and MOUs. MOU is a form of, uh, like a contract. It's a little informal, but it's still a contract. And basically, here are your dollar limits here. Anything 40,000 and less, how will we'll review? 40,000 to 60,000, my new and chief business officer will review, 60 to 75,000 superintendent will review and, and sign off on it. Anything more than $75,000 has to have board approval. So that particularly if you're going into the summer months and you want to sign a contract for something that's going to happen in July and the board it doesn't meet in July typically, you got to keep that in mind. Public works, this is where you can get into trouble real, real quick. Lot of, lots of rules around public work. And basically, it's any work that's construction or alteration. You see it up there, repair improvements performed by a contractor on de district facilities. And you must collaborate with facilities and maintenance and purchasing and accounting for all pu public works projects, such as the big one is playground equipment. So you call somebody, hey, you know, make this great deal and getting it done. There's a lot of rules we have to go with. Prevailing wage is one of them, and there's some other things too we have to deal with on, on public works. It's a complicated process. So work with your um, 
uh, particularly facilities and purchasing. Now, if our own crew, our maintenance department does it, it's not considered public works. P card. They can be used for bringing uh, my supplies, materials. You see it up there, present registration fees for conferences. It cannot be used for text, but what was happening with, it, with that? People go, oh, I get a great deal on Amazon or whatever for this textbook. They're buying one textbook or 10 or whatever. And they got a great deal because it was the wrong edition, like two editions before. So that was happening. That's, that's why those go through um, uh, curriculum. Uh, furniture, people buying furniture that was not up to standards. <coughs> and equipment, the same way too. Again, exception requests can be made. They'll work with purchasing on that and they're considered on a case by case basis. Probably going to ask you what you're buying, where you're buying it from, and how much kind of thing. They cannot be used for personal expenses. At least once a month, some of the, some of the list serves I get, and I can't think of the accounting list serves. They're, 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 that's exciting reading. But um, um, every once a month, you see somebody, they go on vacation, they have a district credit card in their wallet, and they go somewhere and they use a district credit card. And it usually makes the list serve because they're at a strip club. Okay, it's not very good to use a district credit card at a strip club, okay? So not that anybody will use that, but it's, it's, it's I'd say at least once a month, I, I, I see those all, I paid the money back. It doesn't make any difference, okay? So, so that's why no personal expenses, or you got Fred Meyer, you, and you, and you let, let your debit card at home, and all you have is the P card, and I'll pay the district back. No, don't do that. Or on-site services, I can call somebody up and do some services. They, they should build, they, they have to build a district, invoice it so we get it properly recorded. Uh, single transaction limit is $2,000, and there are limits. Uh, that have been set and the cards allotted to the schools and departments. And that is in procedure 6212P. Sound like Lewis Black here with that P there. Okay. And, um, oh, travel cards. Do not use your district purchasing card when in your office to buy airline tickets or taking that for any kind of travel. Travel cards are for travel, the P cards are for everything else. Uh, some nuts and bolts on the accounting side of the travel on the, and the purchasing card. They have to be reconciled in our Bank of America, the Bank, Bank of America. There's a works program. That's the program that we use within seven days of posting. The expenditure account code for you. Oh, so using food and, food and beverage per purchase. Please use account code or have your office manager use account codes 5010. That tells us that it is food and, and per, don't just put 5,000 in there. And now, one thing the auditors they got us on a couple of years ago, on, the, on particularly with the P card, um, they come back and said, "Well, what was this used for? What was the appropriate public use of these dollars?" And we really couldn't tell them most of the time without doing a lot, a lot, a lot of digging. So um, there was a comment section in the in the um, in the reconciliation process: is what was purchased, what was the purchase of the pur purpose of the purchase? Boy, that's a tongue twister. Uh, and, and no war and peace novels. We just need, you know, supplies for third grade classroom is enough. And name of the event, or oh, the food for food and beverage. So if you call on your food and beverage form, which I'll discuss in about a couple more slides, um, and you call it parent night for preschool, you can try to have the office manager put that same description in there. It makes us easier to reconcile. And cards not reconciled in a lot of time frame. Julie made sure I put this in here. Uh, it's subject to being inactivated and repeated non-compliance may result in cancellation of the card. And the reason why, well, there's doing expense transfer. It's a lot of work for everybody, for the office manager, for the accounting side, it's a lot of work for everybody for that, 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 that did not need to happen. ASB. People say, well, ASB is student funds. What's, what makes it, no, they should follow different rules. As soon as the district touches that dollar, whether it's ASB or whatever, it's district funds, and we have to follow the same rules and regulations involved. Any questions on that? Contact Purchasing or Sarah Dunlop, who's their internal auditor and ASB coordinator. <coughs> Surplus equipment. I got this calculator on my desk. It doesn't work anymore. I want to just throw it away. No. 
there's rules around that too, believe me, there's rules around everything. Um, surplus items must be disposed of properly, and just, you just can't throw it in the trash. And if we have a surplus bulletin board, we go to staff link on purchasing, you'll see the tab that says bulletin surplus bulletin board, and you can submit the items that are no longer needed at your location. So if you don't need that calculator anymore, you can put it on there, and then some other school can pick it up and, and use it, and it'll then be sent out to them. And surplus equipment includes um, furniture, tech equipment, other classroom office equipment, as you, as you can see there. I love the term manipulatives. Um, kits, laptop covers, uniforms, et cetera. And surplus books, if we have surplus books and library books, prior to posting on the bulletin board, books may be made, may be made available to students and parents at a nominal cost. Again, Alan Purchasing or Marcy can help, can help, help you with that. Items on the equipment bulletin board are available for other schools to claim, and if, they if nobody claims it, then distribution services will pick it up for you. And for books, um, distribution services can pick those up. They're held at the warehouse. They're put on big pallets. We send it out to bid, and we say like there is 20 pallets of books. We bid on it, and people bid on it. The highest bid wins, and they, and they get 20 pallets of books. Use what they're going to use it for? God only knows but they can do that. We, 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 get, we get money for that, so not very much, but we get money for it. Do not throw away unneeded items if you don't think of no value, especially if they have a KSD logo on it or KSD name, uh, contact purchasing for, for the restrictions. Payroll, payroll people there, Jan Richards is a supervisor of payroll, and there, there's the staff. Ooh, that did come up very good. Um, this is posted on um, staff link on the, on the payroll website. This is the cutoff schedule. So you see Friday, September 1st, those will be paid on September 29th. So if those timesheets come into us on September 5th, they're not getting paid in September. They'll get paid in October. That's very important to hit, to hit those, um, hit those cutoff, cut, cutoff dates. When you deal with 4,000 checks, you just can't run one check at a time. In the current um, KEA collective bargaining agreement, there's a, there's a citation for you. Time sheets for extra duties completed in 1617 must be received in payroll on or before that September 1st date. Payment will not be made for time sheets submitted after this date. There's one qualification. Happens every year. Somehow or another, it's a stack of timesheets got on an administrator's desk and it, and it didn't come to us in time. If it's not the employee's fault, we'll pay those. Last year we paid $25,000 in timesheets we didn't have to pay, but they sat on somebody's desk. So get the timesheets in, tell your people if you want to get paid for any work in the 16, 17, I have to have these by September 1st. Payroll, they have to be in payroll on September 1st, not true to you, so you can sign at the in payroll on September 1st. There's some um, bullet points here on, on timesheets here. Timesheets must be in payroll. Important thing in timesheets, original signatures on timesheets, no stamping. Anybody can pick up a timesheet and fill it out and put your stamp on there. Payroll fraud is one of the biggest frauds out there, and that happens all the time. So original, that's why I probably require original signatures. If you have a big group thing, big staff development thing, We'll call Jan, she can work out maybe a worksheet for you, but again, that worksheet has to be signed um, by an administrator. And if the time sheet to be signed by an administrator, the teacher's teaching the class, that's, that's not the administrator. It has to be signed by, by the administrator. And it needs to be complete with the account code, <clears throat> particularly if you're using special projects pay. So on the bottom, make sure the whole account code is there. All it does is delay it. If the account code is there, we'll send them back. So make sure the account code is there. If you don't know the account code, call. Oh, another thing too on leave requests, uh, particularly with the systems that we use with time off and ASOP, if you have a request, please um, do this in a timely manner like PDQ, because what happens then is the employee goes back in there and says, oh, I have, I have two EDL days left. Meanwhile, they already took one, but it's just one pending still that hasn't been happened. So they, they said, well, I said I had two days, so I'm taking two more days. In reality, I only had one day. So make sure you do those, those are um, done in a, in a time, timely manner. 
Let's look at some other policy procedures. Employee recognition, this was a new one, 6214P. This was instituted last year. This is just for review. Dollar limit is $50 annually per individual. People are asking why $50? $50 and less is what the IRS considers as de minimis or with little value. Anything more than that, we should be 1099 the person. So if you get the person, hundred dollar something or another, a nice pen and pencil set or a desk set, and that's hundred and fifty that's hundred and fifty dollars. They should be ten ninety nine for a hundred for that's taxable income as a hundred as a hundred dollars. So that's why it's fifty dollars. Group recognition awards, let's say you have an English teachers and and they got an award for the best test scores or in the region or whatever, that could be a um, hundred dollars for the whole group and annually. Award is subject to district purchasing and expenditure policies and grant restrictions. We had one first, one somebody a long time ago. They got an award for being invested with, with this grant, but they gave an award, but the grant did not allow for the giving the that that that, that, type, that type of expenditure. So they couldn't use the grant funds. And again, refer to the uh, procedure 6214P for it gives you a whole list of stuff which you can buy and uh, what's uh, and what's acceptable. Uh, travel procedures. Travel authorization form must be completed prior to making the trip. We've had people come in asking for their um, pre-game checks and there's no travel authorization form. Or we have people turning in their travel um, plan form and there's no authorization form. So nobody approved, no one approved this trip. So that has to be done before you go out on district travel. And it's also to make sure that all the signatures are, pop, are, are on the form. Is any uh, out of state travel, the superintendent ha has, has to approve it. If there's any out of country travel, like to Vancouver or Toronto or wherever, um, the, the, the school board has, has to approve that. The completed travel authorization form should be, must be received in county 10 days prior to the trip in order so that they, their per diem check can be run. Remember, we run checks on Thursdays. So if you turn it in on Friday, you are leaving on that next Monday, well, you're not going to get your per diem check. So make sure that they make sure that they're turned in early enough so we can uh, get the per diem, per, per diem check for, for meals and incidentals. And the travel card is due back in the county the first work day after return to work. We don't want the travel card sticking in somebody's wallet so they can go to the strip club and, 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 and use it there. Uh, Travel cards are for lodging, baggage fees, ground transportation expenses, not for meals. We have people pull up travel card, use it, and won't work at a restaurant. So we'll get a sort of card we decline, and have any cash on them, and it's, 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 not, it's not a good situation. And it says right on that when you pick up the packet, not, not, not for meals. And then the reimbursement claim form needs to be submitted to the county within 10 working days after the staff member returns. Just to let you know on, the, on this procedure, we're, we're looking at it. There's some things we want to streamline on that, so we will be reviewing that, the whole travel procedure in the fall. So watch for, watch for those emails. Oh, here's my favorite subject. Uh, Non-travel food and beverage purchases, and that's 6240P. Just to give you some history on food purchases, I feel like when I have these mics, I should break, should break out the salt, but anyway. Um, back in 1516, we spent on food $342,672. That's the food that was coded correctly, okay? And this past year, remember, two years ago was 342. This past year, 132,000. So we spent uh, almost $100,000 less. And I checked the budget for next year, it's 77,000. So we're getting better with food purchases. One thing for this year, for food, food, for food purchases, we won't be approving food purchases for staff. So, not for adults. And also another thing on food, if it's an hour meeting, do you really need food? Okay. Um, things are nice. To do, but is it required? So just keep it in the back of your mind. Um, again, that's the weird, remember accounting, we like forms. Um, the light meal and uh, fresh consumption forms required to be completed 
would like those completed at least seven days in advance. Purchases under $500. If you're going to spend more than $500, you need that form filled out, and you also need the form that's in excess of $500, which would be approved by the appropriate chief officer. So if maintenance was having a shit day, which was more than $500, Mike Newman would need to approve that form too. And food purchases made on this is my friend, prior to buying. So, so we've already bought this stuff. And we find out it's not an approved event. Uh, someone's going to pay for that. And it's not the district. So we had, we had an administrator use grant funds for dinner. And it wasn't approved by the grant. And basically, I wasn't going to pick it up. So that person paid out 500 bucks. So keep that in mind. Fundraising. So um, this is 6130, which is the district fundraising, and 3530, which relates to student fundraising. And they're basically the same. Uh, fundraising efforts must not interfere with educational programs. Student participation must be voluntary. No door-to-door -door sales by elementary students. And fundraising should be short duration. Now, when I was going to high school, there was always one high Kennedy High School, their band always had year-round fundraising. They're always, always fun. people just tired of li li listening to them. So keep them short, two to four weeks. And there's a whole fundraising um, procedure there, so in 6130P. And then it had to be reconciled. And any general fund fundraising, that's a tongue twister, must be pre-approved. It's pre-approved by the principal, the SIO, and, and myself. And it's primarily we're looking at equity there. Online sites such as Donors Choose, which is they solicit non-cash donations for supplies, materials, or equipment. Those are permissible. Donors Choose is okay. Prior written permission must be received before posting, and we do monitor those type sites. What was happening, and you guys all know this, teachers were doing this stuff that didn't work with the, with the uh, educational program. They're getting all kinds of, nothing was working, nobody knew what was going on, so that's why we instituted this, this, uh, this uh, procedure. All items are shipped to the school site or district warehouse because they belong to the school district. This is the supplies, material, equipment has become the property of the district. Question is, teacher gets it, and teacher goes to another, to another school, the basic rule is this. If, it's, if it was bought for that program at, let's say, East Hill Elementary, and the program is staying at East Hill Elementary, but the teacher's moving to Lake Young's, well, the materials would stay with the program at East Hill Elementary. If the teacher and the program were going to Lake Young's, then she could take that, that equipment with her. If it's tagged, make sure, it's, make sure you move it off your asset list and get it onto Lake Young's asset list. And then all of the fixed assets, be like computers and things like that, are added to this uh, site room's inventory list. <coughs> all of the GoFundMe's of the world, those are not permitted. And the reason why they're not permitted is um, the way they give us the money is contrary to the state law. School district, we get a donation, has to be, we have to receive 100% of those funds. These sites here, how they make their money, they take a percentage off the top, and I've seen it anywhere between 25 and 40% right off the top. And they also charge you the swipe fee. Every time, every time the credit card is used, there's a swipe fee. So these people that get like, you know, $10,000 in donations, if they see $5,000 of that, they'll be lucky. But that's the way it is. That's the commentary I have about those. But they're not permitted. The reason, the main reason is because run, it's contrary to, to, to state law. And private individuals can raise funds, no problem, and they can donate those funds to, to the school. But um, they cannot use district resources, like computers, to, to, to post it. They cannot represent themselves as a, as a member of the district. So, so if a teacher was doing it, they, they cannot say, I'm a teacher at East Hill Elementary. I'm taking East Hill today, that's coming to my mind. Um, okay. um, it's, uh, I'm a teacher at East Hill Elementary in the Kent School District. That's a no-no. They can say, I'm a teacher in the greater Seattle area. I'm a teacher in the Kent area for my classroom. I need this. They would get the money. They can donate it to, to the school district for, for that purpose. One thing you might want to point out to them, that they will be 1099. It's taxable income. And it'll be 1099 on the ten thousand dollars and not on the net. Because that's that is the cost. And so there's no withholding taxes on that either. 
So that's some of the people that got that, you know, these hundred thousand dollars to go fund these, they get a big surprise at the end. And from other policies, I'm not, I'm not going to go into these. And you can if you want me to, but I don't I think you do. Um, applications for competitive grants and foundation funding. We get people asking, I, I want to apply for this grant. I'm applying for this grant. Well, there are some rules behind that. And look at that 6109P um, on that one. Commercial activities, primarily with sponsorships. Uh, you can look at that one there, 6299P. And you get some memorials, 6114P. And with that, and I didn't need to sound my horn. Hey, great, you guys have been great. So tonight I thank you and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ross. Ralph, uh, as we said, this is a seven times, seven ways conversation. So what we've learned about nuts and bolts, uh, some of the processes that we need to shore up, not only at uh, the district level, certainly, but also at the local school level. As I reflect on today, I, I did my very best to create a wordle. It didn't work out. So I'm going to create uh, a, just a simple reflection of what stood out when I observed our classes, our learning sessions. I observed, first of all, the characteristics. There were truly experts in the room providing real world relevant examples of how we address the needs of our students. I heard. Here, Progressive Discipline, Ken Meridian, led by Principal Dr. Wade Berenger and JP and Mike, who are here sharing the values that we extol in our district of equity, excellence, and community, which means that we need to meet our students and the staff who serve them and our families where they are. If we say we're going to teach students how to read, teach students how to write, teach students how to speak, or teach students how to compute, we also need to understand that we need to teach students the responsiveness in their behaviors. And I think I heard very clearly, I think our students in our community, they, they know, and we know, how we should behave. Sometimes we just have to create conditions so those behaviors will be owned by those who are in our midst, in our classrooms, in our buildings, in our offices. Uh, I want to thank the team for sharing. I had opportunity to, to see Dr. Uh, excuse me, uh, well, obviously listening and working with Dr. Schmoker, but he referenced John Hattie's work. And I want to thank, uh, as I saw, Principal Unruh providing an example of Mill Creek's road to answering the PLC questions. What do we want our students to know and be able to do? How will we know if they've learned it? And what will we do when they have learned it? What will we do when they haven't? And I'm almost gonna slide that one in. Remember, what will we do? That fifth question, what will we do? How will we celebrate when they have learned it? What are those small victories that we need to celebrate? I also saw PBIS, uh, and I want to thank principals Dean Ficken and Scott Abernathy for their work. They outlined, highlighted successes. Again, examples of how we teach expectations and show that behaviors are not something that we can take for granted. However, when relationships are established, when expectations are set and practiced, remember, Seven times, seven ways is not just about speaking or saying something, it is about learning. What the latest research now, I think we all know this from our own examples, professional development, if you truly want it to stick, if we, we want the behaviors to change 
permanently, consistently, pervasively. Professional development needs to take place. Whatever that behavior we want to see, 30 hours at minimum to 100 hours before we see consistent behavioral changes. So with that in mind, how often have we expected consistent pervasive changes and we've not put in that level of time? I want to appreciate uh, and thank our IT team for their work on the why and support and increase opportunities for success, especially as we work to become more operationally effective and efficient. And I also, again, want to thank Ralph for reminding and reinforcing the work. What I shared earlier today uh, about our priorities, strategic initiatives, what I also shared about our current conditions, specifically our financial conditions, it was to inform, it was to disrupt in terms of our learning, it was also to remind us that if we do not take care of these small things, over time, those small things become very large things. And I'm, I'm being very simplistic, but I think you understand, or I trust we understand, uh, those conditions that are set for us. You have, I did not mention, some of the additional work that you put forth in terms of our plan, the savings that we've, we've been able to, uh, obviously, to, to manage based on your efforts. Again, closer than we've ever been, certainly further away than what we expected to be. I want to leave you with a reminder of our why. Our why today, our why tomorrow, and August 31st, oh, by the way, ready or not, and I know we'll be ready. August 31st, pre-K, 12th grade, our students will be ready, and they'll be depending upon everyone in this room. I remember those kindergarten students. When you think about 13 years from now, what will you be doing in 2030? Just as importantly, what will they be doing? What I'm going to, we need to, uh, can you help me? It's the last, that's the, any other PowerPoint? Let's see. Do you want the video, the video, the cone, the orange cone? Yes, that will be a student. First, the uh, reminder. There should be two links. All right. Okay, let's just go to, let's go to Did You Know? If we did have, you would hear from our students, some of you have heard it before. This is the most recently updated version. Just think about how we're preparing our students for their futures. Take a look.
All right, so you've seen the context. That's the question for us. We're not going to answer it today, but there'll be times when we're purposely going to respond. What does this all mean for us? Think about today's learning from coherence to systems. Does what we're doing make sense? And if not, do we need to say something? Do we need to let someone know? <clears throat> Whether it's our work with children, our work with our colleagues, our work with our families. As we prepare for 2017, 2018, I am charged and ready to make sure we're better as a result. Today, we've learned. Now, we should know better. And our charges will we be able to, how will we do better as an organization? I'm excited, happy to be here. We not want to be anywhere else. Leaders like you, we have everything we need, this just in, to solve every problem that we have. And we've got some problems. That's life. How do we make sure that we minimize those? Successes, there are many. Let's focus on those as well. Thankful to our school board directors who, uh, who have been here as learners and extolling the virtues of learning. That's our core business to our leaders at the district office, our school-based leaders, our new leaders to Team KSD, our IT staff. We couldn't do it without you. And quite frankly, we wouldn't want to. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to our leadership. Uh, we leave Scott Abernathy. Team will have some work to be done as it stands. Thank you again for all you do. And as my wife tells me, once again, thank you for all you don't do. Let's have a great year. <laughs> well done.